So my part of the uh, the day is fairly easy. I want to introduce the concept of what we're doing here today. This is part of our effort at Shriner University in the Texas Center to serve as what we describe as honest brokers, just people that are inviting folks to the conversation. When we started the Texas Center, we knew that Texas had a lot of very large conversations going on. And we were looking for a way to where we could join those conversations in an honest and approachable way. And the idea of, well, let's bring people into the room that may be approaching the exact same topic from very different angles and have these conversations. Instead of it being um, uh, some sort of fisticuffs on social media or... Uh, perhaps an op-ed in a statewide magazine. Let's have them all in the room, and let's all have a, a way of looking at each other as individuals, as human beings, and have those sorts of uh, great exchanges, primarily because it's important. <laughs> I mean, what we're doing today feels historic to me. Uh, not historical, but historic because of the importance of what we're doing here and what I think that we can accomplish. Now, I'm going to take a point of privilege. Uh, I am interested in learning stuff I don't know. And I have learned from my experience with the Texas Center that there is a vast amount of things I do not know. Now, back when I was a history professor, I knew it all. But now that I'm an administrator, I don't know near what I thought I knew. And so I am really, really pleased uh, by the, the intellectual horsepower that's in this room. You can take a look at the, uh, the introductions uh, on the programs. The people that are here are uh, just rock stars, superstars, thought leaders, in this space of Texas and Mexican relations, Texas and Mexican-American relations, Anglo-Mexican-American relations, border issues. I mean, it's a, a pretty nice, concise who's who of who needs to be in the room. Uh, John Moran Gonzalez is a literary guy, so he's looking at it from the letters angle which is awesome. Ben Johnson's a historian, uh, also affiliated with the Texas State Historical Association. I'm in that organization as well. Ken Wise uh, is here too. He's with the Texas State Historical Association. Difference is Ken came from Houston and Ben came from Chicago to be here today, but they go to the same uh, barber. Uh, <laughs> yeah, take that out of the film, please. Uh, <laughs> but uh, every, everybody is so approachable. Uh, I had a chance to meet uh, Ben and John for the first time over at Pax Coffee, and we had a great conversation and an easy rapport, uh, and that's always a good start. I've known Ken uh, for a very long time as well, and he is... Uh, in the sort of public history space, he is something of a celebrity with his uh, Wise About Texas podcast. But he's also spent a lifetime uh, in the law in the state of Texas. And so a bunch of what we're going to talk about involves legal matters. I thought it would be nice to have a legal mind on hand. Y'all come on in. Uh, so Ken Wise is here, Ernesto Rodriguez, and I have been friends for a uh, couple of decades. And I knew him uh, when he was a, a young researcher at the Alamo. Now he's an old researcher at the Alamo. But we've uh, run in a lot of those circles. And it has been interesting to watch how the Alamo has transformed over those decades, uh, especially with the large conversations going on in the state. How do you make the Alamo relevant? 
in terms of the conversations we're going to have in this room today, but also how do we make the Alamo relevant in the future? Because Texas is changing. This is going to be a much different place a couple of generations from now. And so how do you continue telling that Alamo story to where it resonates with newcomers as well as the natives? Uh, ben Montoya is uh, my, uh, my mentor, <laughs> my history mentor here on campus. He is a, a, a brilliant scholar and looks at things in ways that I find extraordinarily well, they're interesting and he's got such a facile mind that he can make it really appeal to not only undergraduates in his classroom, he's uh, highly regarded as a professor here on campus, but also to the public, and I'm glad to know him. Uh, Travis Frampton is the provost of this school, and he will be really facilitating a bunch of the conversations today. His background is in religion and philosophy. He is what I would refer to as a deep thinker. And uh, he brings a lot of those deep thoughts to everything he does. And he will take something that I look at and say, well, this is kind of a binary sort of thing. It either is or it is not. And he'll say, or it, it is perhaps. And I'm like, oh, Travis, come on, man. You know, you're really uh, screwing up my worldview here. Uh, later on, we will be joined by Jerry Patterson. Jerry Patterson will appear in the uh, Pulverneer documentary that we're about to launch. Uh, he also helped produce that. Uh, his longtime experience with the state of Texas was as the uh, land commissioner for the general land office. And as a result, he was very intimately associated with issues of land. And a bunch of what you'll learn about in this uh, video is about questions of land and property and who has a place and who does not. And Jerry also was very involved with the Alamo. So I've asked him to join the discussion this afternoon. Uh, speaking of land, he had an HOA meeting in Austin that was kind of a clutch meeting that he couldn't miss. I said, well, you know, you're the guy, land commissioner. So uh, he'll join us this afternoon. And I think that is going to be our lineup today, uh, which is, again, a who's who. So what I'm going to do now is... Uh, Ben, do y'all want any introduction to the movie? All right, let me get it queued up, and I'll give you the microphone. All right, thank you, Don. I'm John Moran Gonzalez. Uh, I'm at, up at the University of uh, Texas at Austin in the English department, and a member along with my colleague, uh, Ben Johnson, of the group Refusing to Forget. Now, we're delighted to be here today and I'd like to thank you, Don, for the, uh, for the invitation to speak here, precisely because these kind of conversations are so incredibly important. And so, I, th you know, they have been contentious at times, but they are also absolutely necessary. And I also, I think we appreciate your effort to make it a very kind of civil and con uh, convivial uh, conversation, and that's what we look forward to uh, today. And I'd also like to thank uh, President McCormick and Provost Frampton for hosting this event at Shriner University. I think it speaks volumes that uh, Shriner is taking the lead in fostering these conversations. So I'll just say that the legacies of the Rangers, both good and bad, saturate Texas, including here at Shriner. As, uh, Founder Charles Schreiner was a ranger during the late 1850s. Uh, ben and I wanted to start today's discussion by screening this film because it powerfully captures some of the experiences of the kinds of racial violence that unfortunately has been all too common in the history of the ranger force. Today's event is indeed an academic one about how we should remember and tell the history of the ranger force and this film brings home why this topic matters and remains relevant today. After the film, we'll have more to say about the wider patterns and consequences. Uh, but for now, let's go ahead and uh, screen the film. For years after the massacre, horses would rear and wouldn't go near the spot where those bodies lie. 
Fifteen men were taken out in the hours of darkness, lined up against a bluff, and executed. Corbinair is the last of a long set of killings. Who did the shooting? Who did the most effective cover-up? You know, I want to add my thanks, um, especially to Don Frazier for organizing this event and for reaching out. Um, I want to express my appreciation for the presence of President McCormick and Provost Frampton. I realize I've never actually given a talk in front of a university president or a provost, not even my own. So um, hopefully, I, hopefully I won't mess it up. Um, but it's uh, really a pleasure to be back here in Texas. I uh, have fond memories uh, uh, as a child of being at uh, uh, at Wyo Ranch, um, and um, I look forward to learning from uh, the other panelists and, and, and from the audience members. Uh, the Port Veneer Massacre was one of the most tragic events in the history of the Ranger Force and indeed of all of Texas history. Unfortunately, it was not an isolated event. From the inception of the Ranger Force in the 1830s to recent strikes and civil rights protests, Rangers have violently suppressed Native Americans, Mexicans, African Americans, and activists of many backgrounds. In this part of today's event, Professor Gonzalez and I will relay some of this history and describe some of our efforts to bring it to wider public knowledge. Those of us in the room have just watched the documentary Poor Veneer, Texas. Our comments will slightly recapitulate some of that for some of those who may be watching this um, who haven't just finished watching the movie. In 2014, with other scholars of Texas and Mexican American history, we founded an organization called Refusing to Forget, aimed at taking the knowledge that we had as scholars into the public realm. And I want to briefly gloss some of our activities. The first major goal we had was to uh, have a museum exhibit of some sort about the border violence of the 19-teens. Uh, museums are, I'm sad to say, as someone who writes history books, more widely turned to by the public than our college professors um, uh, or professional historians as sources of reliable historical information. And there's extensive uh, public survey data that shows that they're actually um, viewed as more trustworthy by a greater percentage of the public. Um, so that just seemed like an obvious kind of venue for us to reach out to, to try to, um, you know, to try to use to get some of these stories in wider circulation. And so we had early conversations with uh, the person, Margaret Koch, who was then the um, director of exhibits at the Bullock Museum of Texas History in Austin, and now is the director of the museum. And, um, and we work together with them, we in Refusing to Forget work together with their staff to develop an exhibit called Life and Death on the Border that um, discuss these events in terms of the kind of the longer sort of before and after of the history of the U.S.-Mexico borderlands. It ran for four months in 2016, um, won a national award, and recently we were able to secure National Endowment for the Humanities funding to develop a traveling version of this, which will start to travel around the state in different locations starting next year, starting at South Texas College and ending up, I think, in 2024 at the Houston Holocaust Museum. The second thing we did was to um, pursue historical markers, including the one for Poor Veneer that's featured in the documentary, which our colleague, Professor Monica Munoz Martinez, um, for which, you know, she wrote the she wrote the application. I think we were, and the, the ones we applied for were the Poor Veneer marker, uh, one called La Matanza, just a, in general about the, the violence, which is situated in Cameron County, the county at the southern tip of the state. Um, whose principal city is Brownsville, one in Laredo to Jovita Idar, who we'll have to, a little bit to say about later, who was an um, important Laredo journalist who spoke out against these events and had her own um, collision with the Ranger Force, and then one in Hidalgo County, right, the second county up the, up the Rio Grande from the southern tip of Texas, uh, commemorating the double murders by Texas Rangers of Jesus Bazan and Antonio Longoria, which is one of the most consequential um, killings along with poor veneer in those years. And our motives for doing this were very much the same as for approaching the museum, right? They reach a wider audience. Um, they are regarded by the general public as carrying a kind of authority. And in this case, it's not just a private museum or a university or a particular academic. It's the state of Texas that puts them up. And the descendants that we worked with, um, particularly some of the descendants of poor veneer, 
um, with whom um, especially Monica Martinez had developed a close working relationship, you know, really conveyed to us their sense of the importance of that state of imprimatur, right? This is as close to a kind of recognition by the state government of um, what was done, you know, by its own agents has happened. And those have, some of those have become, um, in ways that we, I don't think ever planned or envisioned, sites of remembrance um, and mourning. So I was, um, went past the poor veneer marker this last spring on a um, trip, spring break trip to Big Bend National Park, and I stopped there, and there are, you know, there were desiccated flowers, uh, votive candles and stones left at the at the base of it. Uh, on Day of the Dead, um, the Matanza marker in Cameron County was covered in flowers, and there was what we learned was the third annual um, uh, procession that was made. Um, you know, to the marker. So these are, you know, organized. We don't know who did these things, right? They're, they were organized and, and enacted by other, by other people. Um, thirdly, we were interested in furthering academic knowledge of these events. And particularly, we received a National Endowment for the Humanities funding to run a conference three years ago on the centennial of the Canales hearings, which, as you know from watching the documentary, were uh, an investigation into the conduct of the Ranger Force in the 19-teens, and particularly, I think, lo looking at some of the reverberations in political and social and, and intellectual life uh, of these events that resulted in the, you know, the publication of an edited volume that's being used in some, in some classrooms. So, uh, you know, we were still interested in the academic track. Um, fourth, um, uh, we developed a website, right, as a kind of as a key resource and a way to reach other people. It has information on the history. It can be found at refusingtoforget.org. We have the social media accounts, one of the platforms, of course. Um, I'm not sure how long it's going to be around. Uh, um, uh, if last week was if last week was any guide, but our website includes links to more sources. It has a blog with updates about our projects or um, information. Um, you know, connecting the events of the 19-teens to more recent developments. And you can also find an annotated copy of the state, the 1919 hearings, a kind of, you know, reader's guide to that. It's, it's so long, it's helpful to have something that, that breaks it down. And this will be one of the platforms that we use next year for our On This Day in Ranger History campaign um, that we will be running to call attention to some consequential events even beyond the scope of the 19-teens, so expanding, refusing to forget um, focus in the bicentennial year of the of the state ranger force. Fifthly, we worked with secondary school teachers, right, mm -hmm. um, individually uh, at, at conferences and classroom visits, talking about the content of some of this material and brainstorming ways in which it can be brought into uh, middle and high school classrooms. You know, in ways that speak to in ways that speak to educational standards. Uh, we do have one lesson plan about Jovita Dar that's actually on the website and hope to be developing more soon. We've recently added a member, Mr. Juan Carmona, who's a debate coach and a high school social studies teacher at, at Donna High School who's, who's working on this. Uh, we also engage, sixthly, in media outreach to inform journalists about the long history of anti-Mexican violence, including incidents like, um, including incidents like Poor Veneer. And then seventh, we worked with filmmakers, right? I ended up meeting Andrew Schapter, um, the person who made Poor Veneer, Texas, who I'm sorry to say um, succumbed to cancer before the film was, uh, you know, was finalized, um, was released. But I met him at the Bob Bullock Museum the day after the exhibit opened. And you'll hear more, I think, from Jerry Patterson about the kind of origins of this film. I mean, it was, it was well underway, but we spent a lot of time um, working with, we spent a lot of time working with him. Uh, and doing some other sort of consultation with filmmakers. So there's a proposal that we hope that Netflix will green light about a remake on a longer basis of the movie Giant, which is probably familiar to many of you and also very much about um, the shared history of the borderlands. Um, and there's another film that's under partial production they call us City Ciosos, and there's at least two documentaries we're aware of um, in various states of development that we're, we're working closely with the filmmakers on. So in the second part of this presentation, I'd like to expand a bit on the scope of the legacies of the violence of the 19-teens. 
as which is of course the focus of, of refusing to forget, particularly as it pertains to the Rangers. Now, uh, both uh, Ben and I have written about this in our respective books, as, ha as in have many of the other members of Refusing to Forget. Uh, but just to re recapitulate that along the border at that time, uh, Texas Rangers, uh, county law enforcement, and vigilantes killed hundreds, if not thousands, of people of Mexican descent, including men and women, uh, the aged and the young, longtime residents and recent arrivals. Some were ex summarily executed after being taken uh, captive or arrested or shot under the flimsy pretext of uh, attempting to escape. Now the terror was spread far beyond the ranks of those killed. Uh, quote, one or more of us may have incurred the displeasure of someone and it seems only necessary for that someone to whisper our names to an officer, to have us imprisoned and killed without an opportunity to prove in a fair trial the falsity of the charges against us, close quote. This is uh, uh, the, the referenced in the film uh, as uh, the plea of the residents of King, Kingsville in a telegram to President Woodrow Wilson in 1916. To continue the quote, some of us who signed this petition may be killed without even knowing the name of him who accuses. Our privileged denunciators may continue their infamous proceedings, answerable to no one." Close quote. Far from being surreptitious, the violence was welcomed, celebrated, and even instigated at the highest levels of society and government. As decapitated bodies floated down the Rio Grande and thousands fled to Mexico, one Texas paper spoke of, quote, a serious surplus population that needs eliminating, close quote. Prominent politicians proposed putting all of those of Mexican descent into concentration camps and killing any uh, who refused. For a decade, people would come across skeletons in the South Texas brush marked with execution-style bullet holes in the back of their skulls. And this violence had wider social resonances. It was the key to the imposition of a Jim Crow style of segregation on those of Mexican descent, limiting their voting and relegating most to segregated neighborhoods and schools. Uh, this was, in fact, the world that my uh, grandparents uh, lived in, my parents uh, grew up in, uh, and in the lower Rio Grande Valley of the 30s, 40s, and 50s. It was the world I was born into during the 1960s, as its legacies had not, had only started to fade by then. On the other hand, this period also catalyzed a Mexican-American civil rights movement. Uh, the course of the uprising by Los Sediciosos convinced key Mexican-American uh, uh, intellectuals in South Texas that the revolutionary Mexican nationalism was a dead end and that they were much better off organizing themselves as American citizens with equal access to rights and protection under the U.S. Constitution. These figures include former state representative uh, J.T. Canales, uh, whom we saw in the documentary, who played a key role in the 1929 formation of the League of United Latin American Citizens, or LULAC, and which in subsequent decades would fight for equal uh, treatment and the voting and civil rights of uh, Latinos. Uh, I would also add uh, that in my, in my <coughs> own work, I take a look at the kind of uh, uh, consequences as they get worked out in expressive culture. So we find uh, the, the uh, incidents of La Matanza referenced in uh, Corridos from the border, uh, especially the one known as Los Sediciosos. Uh, and it's reflected later um, in the works of uh, authors like Américo Paredes and, uh, uh, and, and uh, becomes uh, I would also add that the kind of uh, uncritical celebration of the Rangers becomes a, a 
cornerstone of the Texas Centennial of uh, 1936, uh, where uh, the, the kind of mythology that, as we now know it, as we now recognize it, becomes enshrined in uh, popular culture, mainly in radio and in uh, later television and film. Uh, so uh, yes, there had been pulp novels and that sort of thing beforehand, but it really became enshrined uh, in this era. So um, I, I, would, I would also add that I think we saw a, a, a fantastic example of the way that it's influencing the production of expressive culture today with the song that uh, was sung at the memorial service uh, uh, four years ago uh, by one of the descendants. So the 19-teens were an exceptionally violent and unlawful period in Ranger history, and it would be comforting to think of it as an aberration in terms of the history of the force, but in some ways it's not. So now what I'm gonna do briefly in this section is going to gloss some other events in Ranger history that are not so different perhaps than poor veneer. There's much more to be said on any of them. Uh, brevity is not necessarily the great talent of academics, um, but I'm trying really hard here, and I'm happy to you know, expand on these later today if, if that's of interest. Uh, the first I would point to are attacks on Indians. The Ranger Force played important roles in the dispossession and expulsion of almost all native peoples from Texas. This was not just in moments of organized warfare between Indian nations in Texas or the United States, but also in moments of peace involving attacks on non-combatants, women, and children. To give one example, on January 15, 1879, Rangers under the command of former Klansman G.W. Arrington attack a group, attacked a group of Kiowa and Comanche hunters in the Panhandle, killing and scalping their leader, Kiowa man known as Sunboy. The presence of U.S. soldiers kept them from extending their attack on the large encampment of women and children. The Kaya were there hunting by permission of the U.S. Army, which is why they were being accompanied by soldiers. And Arrington's attack ended up the reverberations of it leading to the closure of Texas borders to Indians who had been recently removed into what was then um, Indian territory, later, of course, Oklahoma. Second, and this will also be part of our uh, on this day campaign next year is to call attention to the important work of the Rangers in protecting the institution of slavery. Many Rangers tracked down people who fled bondage, who were generally trying to reach freedom in Mexico, which abolished slavery a generation before the United States. One of those Rangers, William Bigfoot Wallace, is in the Ranger Hall of Fame and Museum, whose display praises his ability to find the tracks and signs of escaped slaves and to carry them back into bondage. At other times, the service turned into larger scale paramilitary violence, as in 1855, when Ranger Captain James Hallahan, Callahan led a company of Rangers that looted and set fire to the Mexican border town of Piedras Negras before being driven back by uh, Mexicans and fugitive slaves and uh, escaped slaves who had become Mexican citizens and their other Mexican allies, creating an international incident for which Mexico has later paid reparations by the US government. Third, the Rangers also engaged in repression of political movements, violating the rights, the constitutional rights to free speech and assembly. During World War I, for example, they kidnapped Tom Hickey, who published the socialist newspaper, The Rebel, from Hallettsville, Texas, that notorious bastion of Bolshevism, um, near where my family actually used to own a farm. I would always drive through Hallettsville and think of it as the center of one of the largest socialist newspapers in the United States, which was um, not always easy to do. Hickey was a kind of Irish redneck version of Bernie Sanders a century ago, lamenting the loss of farms by Texas's rural population and what he viewed as the control of the political process um, by a small wealthy elite. He criticized the postmaster general who was um, a Texan for expelling tenant farmers and replacing them with convict labor on his plantation, which the week after that article came out resulted in the shutting down of his paper. Two years before that act, Rangers stormed the offices of El Progreso, a Laredo newspaper whose editor, Jovita Idar, uh, who will have a quarter actually coming out with her, um, with her portrait on it this next year. Um, and Idar had criticized U.S. border policy and violence against Mexican Americans of the sort that we've already discussed. They smashed the presses and trashed the office, ending the newspaper's publication. 
This kind of state violence continued into the 20th century, long after the Rangers were reorganized and modernized to look like other police forces. And I think one of the main narratives there, including one of the ones that is um, uh, told by the Ranger Hall of Fame and Museum is the sense that the Rangers are sort of comprehensively overhauled and reformed in the 1920s and their organization and supervision is brought into line with general policing practices. And I think that's actually true, but as we know, the history of policing in this country and elsewhere since the 1920s has itself not been without, uh, not been without conflict. And, and there are two cases uh, in the 20th century where ranger violence actually makes its way to the United States Supreme Court. So this is something, again, like the Canales hearing in which the conduct of the ranger force um, becomes an item of national news. In 1937, to take the first, Rangers M.W. Williamson and E.M. Davenport took Bob White, a black laborer from Polk County, chained him to a tree, severely beat him, and threatened him with death until he confessed to the rape of a white woman named Ruby Cochran. Evidence presented by White's attorneys before the U.S. Supreme Court revealed that Williamson and Davenport had forced White's confession, which had then been dictated by a special prosecutor on the case and written by the Polk County prosecutor. In other words, Texas Rangers and prosecutors in the case had manufactured the very confession that was used in court to condemn Bob White. Making matters worse, the case was tried before an all-white jury, this is Jim Crow, Texas, that quickly sentenced White to death. Although the U.S. Supreme Court overturned the jury's verdict, Bob White was shot and killed in a Conroe, Texas courtroom by the, um, by the woman's husband, by Ruby Cochran's husband, who was promptly found innocent of any crime. 20 years later, in 1956, to name another example, a white mob of more than 300 assembled outside of Mansfield High School near Fort Worth, determined to prevent the enrollment of three black children as ordered by a federal court. Ranger Jay Banks joined them and stood in front of an effigy of a black man hung from a noose, making no effort to protect the students and uphold the law. A few years later, Banks served as the model for a 12-foot bronze statue of a ranger labeled One Riot, One Ranger, which used to stand, I think I'm not the only person to remember this, um, in the lobby of Love Field, where I would see it when I would fly up to visit my, my grandmother who lived in Dallas from Houston. Um, there's some other examples of these that I can talk about, but I think um, in the interest of time, I'll um, yield back to my colleague. Well, we've, we hope we've covered some significant moments in Ranger history and aspects of that history. Now in this last section, we'd like to say a bit about why we think this history should be better known. One motive uh, is a deep sense of commitment to the family members of those uh, slain or affected, including those interviewed for the film. Many of us, many of them, I should say, kept memories of these events alive and went to great lengths to document them and would like to see recognition of these events in the public sphere. And I, I would add, I mean, uh, you know, these folks have kept documents over uh, cases uh, uh, brought before various commissions and courts for, for decades, for a century in garages and spare bedrooms. I mean, uh, this was e extraordinarily important for them to hold on to. And we know as much as we do, thanks to them. Full justice for the dead may be impossible, but an honest reckoning with this history has great meaning, as I think we saw in the film. Second our, was our frustration that these events are rarely, if ever, taught in schools, despite the large body of academic knowledge that we and others have created about them. Wider public knowledge of, of these events and working with teachers and school districts could change this. Similarly, in much journalism, lynchings and other forms of state violence are portrayed as events that only took place in the South in the 19th century uh, and maybe early 20th and targeted only African Americans. And contemporary border issues have been analyzed as though there were no relevant history of the border, no prior history of this kind of, uh, these kind of events. Third, 
was our frustration with the more widely circulated stories about the Rangers, uh, including uh, those at the Texas Ranger Hall of Fame and Museum in Waco. Uh, these stories often tell uh, a narrative of virtually unvarnished heroism in which Mexicans killed by the Rangers are simply bandits. Uh, the Hall of Fame honors Rangers like Frank Hamer, who we saw referenced in the film, uh, to, to threaten a uh, state legislator, J.T. Canales, um, but that's not something that the Hall of Fame mentions. The Hall of Fame praises Rangers for uh, being slave catchers, for catch catching fugitive enslaved people who simply sought freedom. It's also funded by taxpayer dollars and has official recognition from the state government of Texas. And all of this is backed by the enormous weight of popular culture, as I mentioned previously, from the Lone Ranger to Walker, Texas Ranger, you know, ad, ad nauseum, really. So the last reasons take us up to the, to the present moment. Um, so the fourth one I would add is the um, renewal of racial violence um, in this country and, and some pretty horrifically spectacular ways, right? The 2015 um, church shooting in Charleston, the 2018 massacre at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, and the El Paso Walmart shooting in 2019, the perpetrators of all of which um, you know, had clearly articulated uh, anti-Semitic and other racist messages, um, and to the extent we're able to reconstruct their motives, um, were, you know, their attitudes towards these people and towards their victims were deeply informed, were deeply informed by that rhetoric. Uh, this is, you know, I think as historians, I'm, as a historian, I'm very conscious of change over time. This is not just the same, um, and particularly the role of the state and state agents um, is different. The Texas Rangers do not round up all the young men and uh, boys from villages and line them up uh, and shoot them. And um, that is a sign of changes that have happened in the intervening, you know, in their intervening century. Um, the rhetoric around these groups um, uh, and that imbibed and that clearly impressed the perpetrators of the three massacres that I mentioned, unfortunately, you know, is virtually taken from right out of the past, right? We can still be in 1918 um, if, you just, if you just read those words. Um, and in other ways, of course, state violence in a different sense in the ordinary course of policing has continued. And I think, you know, one of the technological changes of cell phone cameras and cell phone videos has allowed uh, a lot of people to see that um, in a vivid and direct way that was previously hidden from us as came out, you know, most dramatically with the police murder of George Floyd um, in Minneapolis. And I think on that count, you know, what's increasingly struck me are the ways in which, you know, on the one hand, the Rangers are unique. They're their own kind of um, police force, I think, particularly in terms of having a kind of um, legendary status and popular culture. They're really, their only counterpart, I think, is probably the, the Mounties in Canada, right? Um, but on the other hand, what we're really talking about are, are questions of policing, right? And in that sense, they look not so different. When I go back and read the Canales hearings now, I'm just struck by how contemporary they seem, these questions, right, about, um, you know, how many of the police are actually involved in these things? You know, why is it so difficult to find accountability for what may be a small percentage of law officers who engage in these things, and yet some of them seem to be able to engage in them repeatedly, uh, time and again, without suffering consequences? You know, and I mean, I came down here from Chicago, but I just want to acknowledge that I did not have to get on a plane and come to Texas if you want to talk about the difficult issues of, of policing. Like, I could do that. Um, I could do that right in Chicago. And in fact, some of the lawsuits in Chicago against the Chicago Police Department um, that have been settled uh, have included provisions where there was a public memorial to victims of torture, of, of confessions that were extorted under torture that resulted in dozens of men being sent um, wrongly um, to prison for most of their adult lives. And to have the history of this actually taught both in Chicago public schools and in the academy 
you know, in the curriculum of the Chicago Police Academy, which begins to look a lot like Germany uh, and other European countries, but particularly um, Germany or even the FBI Academy here in the United States for whom the history of policing and its connection to the catastrophe of fascism is an important aspect of, you cannot become a police officer in Germany without being very well versed in that, in, in that history. The fifth is the kind of reconsideration of monuments that's underway in this country, right? And the question of who we honor. Uh, we all know the number of Confederate monuments that have come down in this country um, uh, is um, quite remarkable since um, the George Floyd, since the murder of George Floyd, including in places like Richmond, Virginia, the former capital of the Confederacy, and New Orleans, its most, its most important city. We think that some celebrations of Rangers, as at the Hall of Fame, should be reconsidered, but we also want to add to the public memorial landscape, not just subtract from it, and have new markers and monuments up to people like J.T. Canales and Jovita Idar. The sixth and final fact, factor I'll point to are debates over what history should and should not be taught. And as with the question of, um, as with the question of monuments, this is a you know, this changes, this is right, we're in the middle of a lot of change over this. Um, so the question is, should an event like Poor Veneer be taught, right, in a high school history class, in a, a Texas history class, which right now is still taught, as you know, in the seventh grade. Um, and the point I wanna make right now is that Texas's government has recently passed legislation that makes it less likely that history teachers in school districts would show documentaries, this documentary that we saw today, or hold a discussion like this one. Last year, the Texas legislature passed several laws that place a number of restrictions on school teachers, including forbidding them from casting blame on the basis of race or sex, forbidding them from being compelled to discuss current events or widely debated and currently controversial issues of public policy or social affairs, or from saying that slavery and racism are anything but deviations from betrayals of or failures to live up to the authentic principles of the United States. Here I'm quoting the legislation. The American Historical Association, the primary professional organization of academic historians, and 27 other academic organizations oppose these measures in Texas. And they, they, they've been passed in similar ones in many other states. As the AHA wrote, if a teacher cannot cast blame on the basis of race or sex, again quoting the legislation, how are students to understand who owned human property and who was enslaved? or the role of the right prim white primary in the disfranchisement of African Americans. The AHA also objected to the stipulation about a teacher being, not being able to be compelled to discuss current events or controversial issues of public policy or social affairs. This clause, the AHA said, would permit a teacher to reject a social studies coordinator's mandate that a course include the history of conflict in the Middle East, trade with Asia, or political corruption, all topics, indeed virtually all subjects of current interest and debate, have a history that helps to illuminate how we got there and where we are today. At the same time, the Lieutenant Governor. We're skipping that. Uh, oh, no, okay. <laughs> sorry. Uh, oh, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, that, wrong lines. Long story short, long story short. We have no qualms addressing you here today, showing this documentary and laying the evidence about the Rangers and their history before you. Uh, if I were a public school teacher here in uh, Kerr County or other parts of the state, um, I would not do so for fear of losing my job. The work that Refusing to Forget did with the Bullock Museum in Austin might not happen today. And I, I would just add to that 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 work was incredibly in fact effective uh, because we reached over 40,000 people that way. You know, that's way more than, you know, all the academic books we could ever put together over 100 years, I think. The work that we plan to do with school teachers to provide teacher training sessions about these kind of histories is now impossible because of other provisions of the bill that prevent school districts from running workshops funded by outside groups such as refusing to forget. So this backlash against the honest teaching of a full history of Texas, including some of those darkest chapters 
is another reason why we continue our work and that uh, Professor Johnson and I are so pleased by this opportunity to present before you. In closing, we want to take a step back from the details of this history and recent debates over difficult histories, though. All modern nations teach their national histories as a way of fostering identities and finding commonality within their diverse populations. In democratic societies, societies whose governments respect the rights of all citizens, these histories are inclusive and honest. There can be a sense of pain uh, and loss in confronting these dark histories and somehow uh, raising them to public consciousness uh, would seem to rob Texans of their birthright of a happy and uniting history. Um, but there's also triumph in reckoning with this past. It's deeply important to me that my kids grow up in a state and go to schools where their histories are told, including so much of what Mexican Americans have had to uh, overcome. And I think I understand the sense of loss that um, that my colleague mentions. I'm a you know run-of-the-mill white guy who grew up in Texas from parents who grew up in Texas whose families have been here a long time. Um, wherever I go in the world, I walk around as a Texan who's um, somewhere else, even if that ends up being uh, most of the rest of my life. Uh, my ancestors were um, protagonists of this history or actors in this history, and um, their ranks include slaveholders and many Confederate officers and soldiers. Uh, as a child, I would go to my dad's uh, on the weekends and binge watch westerns, basically all day Saturday. Um, and the ones I remember the most are Paladin, Davy Crockett, and of course, The Lone Ranger, one of the books I most remember from my childhood, which I can't find anymore. My parents threw it out as a slender, light red hardback volume of children's stories of heroic rangers. Maybe I can uh, put my head together with some of you and figure out what book it, 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 it was. Um, so I understand that the kind of honest reckoning we're working for can be painful, but I think it can also be a gain for all of us. The idea that the truth is liberating, that we become more whole, more human by embracing it, is a very old one, older than this state, older than this country, older than the language in which we're speaking today. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, writes the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now we see but a dim reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. We think Texas is ready to face its history. Thank you for your attention.